I don't even have to say mic check. All right, thank you, sir. Open for him. I'm sure we're going to have people drifting in. Uh, if you're like some of us, your waiter was slow, and we're just getting here and hoping not to have indigestion. So we appreciate everybody coming. Um, I've been doing this a long time, and uh, since we were in Bowling Green, and I usually start off with this long list of things about, um, you know, we're not, uh, Truth Magazine is not the church. Foundation is not the church. We don't set brotherhood policy. I think we all understand that, but um, we've been accused of that by people in the past, so I always like to make that clarification. Um, we are not here to write uh, policy for any congregation. Uh, when somebody says we're doing the work of the church, my question is, which church are we doing the work of? Or do you think somehow the universal church has a work on earth that we should be doing? And maybe that's a question worth exploring. But today we're here to talk about, and we have the gentlemen up here who have appeared at the 11 to 12.30 sessions. And so we're starting with the general theme, uh, to go back to Mark, of, of unity. The Lord wants us to be united. Some of his last words on the earth in John 17 were that believers might be one. And yet we know today that that prayer has not been answered, and so that's an area to explore. And sometimes unity of Christians is shattered when Christians misbehave and need to be disciplined, as Jim was talking about just a little while ago. And there's a whole bucket of questions that we could explore with regard to, uh, to all of that. And then Brother Max Dawson, who I'm happy to say, I haven't seen you for a while, Max. I've seen some of these other guys since then. We're glad you're here to tell us about leadership. And you have the advantage or disadvantage of not having spoken yet. So we don't want to tread on your material, but uh, we'll give you a chance, uh, maybe even let you go first and say what's on your mind with regard to that. Um, so wh why don't we just start with that? Uh, I'll go to the end there and ask Max, what, uh, what do we need to know or what are some relevant questions that pop to the surface with what you're concerned with in your material? Well, when I talk about leadership, we're talking about developing future leaders. That's going to be the primary thrust of, of uh, my presentation tomorrow. We'll talk about what happens when we don't prepare, and then we'll talk about how to prepare. And we're going to use Jesus as a model. If folks have the book, they're able to look at the book and see the seven or eight points that I've got about Jesus, how Jesus prepared uh, the leaders, the apostles primarily. And uh, we'll have a few things to say about that. Okay. How do you see that part of the track relating to the, the previous two speakers, to what Jim and, and Mark have talked about? Well, Jim actually, his talk had a lot to do uh, with uh, elders being responsible for holding people accountable. Yeah. And in churches where you do not have good leadership, it is extremely difficult, as some of the questions from the audience demonstrated this morning, it's extremely difficult to exercise what we call church discipline. Uh, people resist. Uh, who gave you the authority to bring up discipline? It, you know, all those things that happen in a, in a men's business meeting. But even among churches that have elders, it is still difficult. Uh, elders have got to have the courage and the faith and the trust in God uh, to carry out what God says. Uh, you know, these aren't things that are optional. Yeah. Uh, I know I moved to one church a number of years ago, and their practice was when someone quits, take a pencil and draw a line through their name. That's as much as they did. And when I began to preach on church discipline, uh, several people thought I was inventing a new doctrine. Uh, it's just something that had not been addressed. Of course, that's been more than 50 years ago. But uh, in some places today, church discipline is just yeah. woefully inadequate. Yeah. I'm not sure the situation has improved in half a century from my observation. And I raised the question in Mark's, uh, in the session after Mark's talk yesterday about, uh, this is kind of a soapbox with me, as some of you know, why are there so many churches without elders? Uh, I don't know anybody who thinks among, quote, conservative sound churches that it's more than 50 percent. Uh, that might be wrong, but I don't know anybody who can document that. I would say it's more like one-third or one-fourth, 
And so we talk about the New Testament pattern and restoring New Testament Christianity, but here's a very glaring area in terms of leadership that that just simply is not the case and the, the facts speak for themselves. So anybody of the other guys, I and mean, Kyle's up here too, are you going to be taking Mike out there? Or we have uh, Lance, 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 uh, Cor- all right, Corey's got the mic. So anybody who wants to chime in with a question, uh, we've got some prompts up here of questions that have already been submitted, but if there's just a burning issue that uh, you want to talk about or you think uh, these gentlemen have not ad- answered adequately. Uh, why I am willing to exercise moderator privilege and kick the question back to one of these guys, or, or as I've said before, run away if necessary. So we can do that too. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Follow up uh, on the very point you were just making a moment ago. I uh, had a discussion with one of the individuals in the audience uh, that regarding what makes a sound church, and if you're dealing with a group of brethren that have qualified men who could potentially serve, but just have a congregation that doesn't want to make that change from the business meeting to the, the, the shepherding, pastoring, overseer model, is that still sound? And my answer would be no. You know, we're, we're, we're clearly violating God's will in a matter like that if we're unwilling to put into practice what he has mandated. The only thought I had about that is that um, when you think about elders and leading congregations in discipline, uh, and especially relating it to unity, uh, if there's going to be unity, it appears to me that the uh, congregation has to have confidence in their elders. They they have to believe in them. Uh, If they don't believe in you and the decisions you make and the directions that you're leading, uh, well, I think it was Max... uh, uh, oh, one of the big leadership gurus, his name won't come to mind, John Maxwell, John Maxwell, uh, that said, he who thinketh he leadeth and has no one following is only taking a walk. And, and I think that's true in, in churches. If, if people are not willing to follow you, you might, not, uh, might as well not even be serving. You can't lead if nobody's following. That's so. right. Well, we have some questions that sort of overlap. Um, uh, Kyle, do you want to join in? What's on your mind? Go ahead. All right. Um, About the tension between uh, the need for unity and all the leadership things that that plug into that, and yet, on the other hand, um, there are differences not only of opinion, but sometimes there is doctrinal aberration, false teaching that occurs. And so there's this tension that... Some one question represented it as a ditch on both sides. So how how do you avoid? And several of our speakers have already referred to how do we avoid falling into the extremes on either side of that kind of of dichotomy? And I should also notice we have uh, our sisters who have spoken on these same topics with us today. And so if any of you uh, have a question, uh, if you can get the attention of Corey up here at the front, uh, he'll be glad to lend you a microphone or anybody else who has comments. Uh, Anything from the distaff side so far? Clarifications, questions, comments? All right. The mic is open. So... So what, what, uh, what do the guys on the stage think about that? How do, we, how do we avoid falling into either one of these ditches? Explain the two sides again. The, 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 appeal, the appeal for unity on the one hand, our commitment to unity and our commitment to truth, or the avoidance of doctrinal error, false teaching on the other, uh, we could be unified. I mean, we learned this a long time ago that if we just shut up about things that brethren disagree about or that even people in the religious world disagree about, if we just shut up about it, you could have all kinds of at least union, if not true unity. But to the extent that we emphasize this is what the Bible teaches, there are people, uh, examples abound everywhere, and some of the brethren here have given examples of it, of people who choose not to follow the biblical pattern or dispute the biblical pattern or dismiss it or redefine it in one way or another. So those would be the two sides of the ditch as, it's, uh, as the questioners have described it. So how would you answer that, Kyle? Well, maybe the, the issue has to do with what is biblical unity, you know, because we can be united in uh, diversity and that's not biblical u- unity. You know, biblical unity is being of the same mind and the same judgment or striving to do that. All right, Mark. Several years ago, we had a John Isaac Edwards came yeah. to speak for us in Alvin, and 
at the time, there was a young preacher from the area that was questioning, had all sorts of questions about the Holy Spirit. And he was at a preacher's luncheon that we had together, uh, bringing this up and then prefacing every statement that he made by saying, I think. And then he'd go off on a tangent. I think. And he'd go off on a tangent. And I thought it noteworthy that John's response to every single time that happened was simply just quote the Scripture and stop. <laughs> that, that he didn't try to fill in the gaps or give all of his, I think this or I think yeah. that, but just let the Scripture speak. And in the realm of speculation, he didn't go there, you know, yeah. which I think he was subtly trying to teach that lesson exactly. to somebody who hadn't quite mastered the concept yeah. yet. Yeah, we probably all said one time or another, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what the Scripture says. Jim? But a, a lot of times, that's exactly where we get into trouble and conflict arises, is we start expressing our opinions about things that are not revealed and, and forcing them and, and pushing that to the point in which we alienate our brethren and maybe isolate ourselves. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim's at, reaching for the mic there. Yeah, I changed my mind, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, uh, I think it uh, was Kyle talked about false dichotomies this morning, <clears throat> and I think that uh, for someone to think that you can't hold on solid ground with the truth and uh, not be united at the same time, that, that's a false dichotomy. Uh, because I know plenty of churches that are united on truth and that are uh, just that. They're, they're united group of people. One of the things that came to my mind a little bit, um, uh, a, a little bit earlier had to do with, uh, I guess, with that very thing, that people just... Uh, need to realize that they, uh, you know, stay solidly with the truth and let you, unity come where it will because we're not going to compromise. All right. Well, one of the questions that was submitted sort of tagging off of that is written this way. Why do unity movements frequently follow the same leftward drift? And I, uh, if, if I've spent time doing anything over the last 40 some years, I did a lecture down at uh, Florida College in 1982 about unity movements and what happened. I mean, going back to the days of Daniel Sommer, who uh, participated in, even though he was as described by one historian, not just on the right wing of the restoration movement, quote unquote, but the very tip of the wing, and yet would engage in conversations with uh, people like Frederick Kirshner, who was a disciple, uh, dean of the Butler School of Religion. And some of you know I organized the Nashville meeting in 1988 and the Dallas meeting in 1990, where we brought dozens of brethren together to talk about our differences. So, um, but, but unity movements, as I su suppose the questioner has in mind, have to do, I think, more with union movements. So maybe we should discuss the difference in unity and union. And I think the reason, my answer to that question would be, the reason they tend to drift leftward is because that's a way to have the appearance of unity. The, the more questions that you're willing to give up your scruples on or to accommodate other brethren, the more brethren you kind of draw within a circle. And especially because in some ways, I mean, the difference in, in talking to somebody who's on your, your doctrinal or theological right as opposed to your left, where on the right, they have a scruple that you don't have. They think I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing that's unbiblical. And to me, that's usually a matter of, I wouldn't use the word indifference, but I don't believe the Bible teaches clearly on that issue. So I, I, it'd be a lot easier for me to accommodate their scruple, which I don't hold. Now, if I'm talking to, not all these guys on my left, but somebody on my theological left who... I have a scruple about, say, instrumental music or something that I can't participate in in good conscience. Now, that's a, that's a different conversation and a very difficult conversation to have. Um, so that would be a beginning of my answer to the question. But we've got a lot of wisdom up here on the stage. So, Jim, you're holding a microphone. Yeah, and, and there's some, something, a question really I want to raise, and that is what makes people think when they go left, what makes people think that when they go left, the further left they get, the more unified they're going to be? Yeah. In fact, I found that to be right the opposite. Uh, in the denominational world, we, we think that division is, you know, kind of a, our own uh, a special baby, but it's not. Uh, there's division all over the denominational world on, uh, on a whole host of things, 
and just anecdotally, by the way, the, the, the difference between union and unity is you can tie two cat's tails together, throw them over <laughs> a clothesline, you'll have unity, but not uh, you'll union, have union, but not, but not unity. unity. Yes. Yeah. And I've never done that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I would, if I can, well, where were the mics being passed? Um, I, I grew up in a congregation in Indianapolis that was essentially the old Sommer congregation. His, Daniel Sommer died before I was born, but his daughter, who edited the old American Christian Review, that is, did the office work while he was out on the road, often attending some of these unity discussions, um, I, I sat on the same pew with her some Sundays. And in some ways, Sommer became um, a role model in terms of being willing to engage and stay in a conversation with people that that he disagreed with seriously. He once said that he would go anywhere on God's footstool, as he put it, um, to, to preach the gospel or to discuss the Bible with Christians, even if it was, as he said, a Romish cathedral or a lager beer saloon. He would go wherever the conversation was. And so there, there's that aspect of you, you can't have a unity discussion without being in the conversation. Um, but he would also notice that... Um, his second wife was Canadian. His first wife had died, and he married a woman from Canada. And at the, about the time, in the 1920s, that the United Church of Canada was forming, where they took the four major Protestant denominations in Canada, which is Baptist, Methodist, I think Presbyterian, I've forgotten what the, all the four were, but they were going to unite them and have one church. We have Canadians in here. Anybody want to answer the question? All right, thank you very much. And so what Sommer observed was that at the end of the day, there were people from all four of those churches that didn't agree to the union and withdrew from the union. And so instead of having four churches, now you got five. And that's often what happens when you have uh, unity movements that turn out to be more union movements. So anyway, that was the question that was asked. Um, okay, yeah, Mike, go ahead. Well, I, when you posed this question, the first thing that came to my mind was one of the restoration principles and sermons that I remember reading about is unity through the restoration yeah. of the ancient order. And that was the means to attain unity. And when you put this question of <coughs> unity or truth, that is not the restoration plea for unity. Yeah. That's correct, and there always was this tension between, uh, I believe you're correct, the early people who left Baptist and Presbyterian and Methodist churches uh, in terms of the Campbells and Stone and, and Scott and some of these others, they, they held those two ideas in tension, and the restoration was the route to, the means to, unity. If people would, as I've sometimes defined the movement, uh, a movement to unite Christians by abandoning denominationalism and uniting on what the Bible teaches rather than dividing over things that it does not say. And what, what sometimes happened was when people veered again to the right or to the left and latched on either to the unity idea without restoration, what you get is the disciples of Christ by the end of the 19th century, within a century after the time of Stone and Scott and Campbell. And on the other hand, there are plenty of examples of people who have pursued restoring the New Testament order without the goal of unity as the outcome and have seemingly been content to, to squabble over their personal uh, opinions and ideas about the Bible that, that really can't be supported, uh, in, in my judgment anyway, uh, or maybe mix in political opinions or whatever the case may be, and some of these brothers have, have cited examples of that. Uh, but, Kyle, you're holding the microphone. What's on your mind? Well, this question about unity movements leaning to the left. Um, left and right, of course, are relative terms. Um, as I think about... Depending on where I am. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we think about the restoration movement, it could be described in one sense as a unity movement, but I don't think of it as leaning leftward. However, uh, in recent generations, I think that's true that the unity movements have leaned more to the left. Now, is that, is that an accurate assessment of the restoration movement, or would they have been perceived as leaning leftward? <laughs> well, it depends on your perspective, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, the, the lean to the left in terms of what produced the disciples of Christ uh, was, I think, an abandonment of the one 
pole, if you look at them as two, maybe two foci and ellipse or something like that, to the more that the, the idea of restoring New Testament Christianity was viewed as divisive, and, and it has been divisive, and in some ways it is divisive. It calls for people to leave denominations, to abandon denominational teaching, to leave creeds behind, and unite on the scripture. And if, if you don't think that's a good idea, if you're creedal or you're willing to abide by what the creed says, you're comfortable in the denomination, that idea is going to appear divisive. I mean, it is a radical idea in some ways. Um, so I, I wouldn't call it necessarily left-leaning, but it could appear to be uh, radically left in some people's books because it calls upon you to disrupt the status quo, if you want to look at it that way. Those, depending upon the creeds, might have considered themselves conservative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, All right, question down here, Corey. This is more of a comment on the original uh, question. And I was just thinking of a passage that was already Bobby Graham, I guess, has mentioned earlier, Ephesians chapter 4. We're just thinking about all of those roles in verses 11 and 12, uh, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. If they kept the attitude, like in the first part of the chapter, lowliness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, but then did... In verse 15, they spoke the truth in love. That's all you can do. Right. And so with, with that, you know, like as Paul would say, he had this spirit of faith that he believed and he spoke. So here, all, all right. of these different categories of, of teachers that know the word of God, have the right attitude, and then just speak it in love. All right. Good comment. Thank you very much. And in some ways, that sort of leads into what Brother Dawson will be talking about because this text is speaking basically of different offices that lead to growth. Did you want to follow up on his observation? Well, when you look at that text, you've got, uh, you also have in verse 13 the idea of unity. Uh, and earlier in that chapter, you have uh, the uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit the bond of peace, one body, one spirit, just as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. You know, we're talking in very broad terms about the religious world and how the religious world has addressed uh, unity or union. Uh, I, I think more in terms of the local congregation. What, are, what have we done in a practical sense in our local congregation? At home, when we get ready to appoint men as shepherds or as deacons, we have a number of questions that we ask. And, and the fundamental question and that, that we don't ask them, but I think for us here, is truth knowable? Can we know that there is something called truth? And can we agree on some of those terms that are found? Uh, can we agree that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism? Uh, and so we ask questions about uh, prospective elders. We'll ask them, can you stand with the current elders uh, with respect to uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Uh, can you stand with us with respect to gambling? Because those are things we oppose. There are other moral issues. Can you stand with us on the nature of the church? Uh, things that we understand are, are fundamental to, toward operating a local church and toward uh, elders overseeing a church. On the other hand, we know that there are going to be times when elders have disagreements with one another. But typically it's not on fundamental issues that uh, comprise the one faith. Uh, typically, it's over matters of scruples, matters of judgment or opinion. And we ask this question, uh, in order to promote unity, if you find yourself in disagreement with the other eight or ten elders on a certain matter, what will you do? And we want, and without prompting them, we want an answer from them. Well, I'm going to stand my ground. If it divides the eldership, divides the church, so be it. I'm going to stand my ground. You know, sometimes brethren cannot see the difference between something they hold as a matter of their faith and something that is a matter of the faith. But what we hope men will do and what our men have done 
over the decades that I've worked with the elders at Dallin Road is when we have that kind of disagreement, I will take a step backward and I will defer to the judgment of the other elders. And we're still able to maintain unity. We're still able to work together without compromising the faith. But a man says, you know, uh, for me, uh, I, I wanted to register my complaint, my protest, but I will leave it there. And when we have that kind of discussion, and then our agreement has been this among ourselves, when we walk out of this office and the congregation asks, what did the elders decide? We speak with one voice. No one says, well, I didn't like it. I was against it, but the rest of the elders said do it this way. That's, that's disunity, and, and that's a disingenuous spirit when someone has that. Amen. So can we agree that there are some things that are matters of truth? We agree on those things and stand together. Local church. Jim? Eight to ten elders. Wow. Wow. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, and I, I may be wrong about this because I never had this experience, Max, uh, but when you've got, uh, you know, six, eight other guys that believe that we ought to go a different direction than you do, it, it's, it seemed to me, at least appears to me, to be a little bit easier to back up than if you're one of two. Uh, when you're one of two, uh, that makes it uh, a, a little bit more difficult and you have to, uh, you have to still do the same thing, though. Yeah. You have to still recognize that one man feels stronger than you do uh, about an, another. I'll often ask uh, my fellow elder. There's only two of us. I know Mark has uh, evidently just recently got into this situation again. I, I'll, I'll ask Tim uh, sometimes. Tim, how, how strong do you feel in this on a scale of one to ten? And if he says, you know, three, I said we're going to do it my way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if we say, you know, if he says, you know, I'm I'm about an eight, uh, then I'm gonna say, well, oh, I don't feel near that strong about it. So uh, it, it helps you get the idea of how another person feels and able to be able to work in these areas and disagree. Well, uh, that's right, Jim. And you've also got this that sometimes. When you're dealing with a matter of judgment, someone may have a, a really, what I would consider a really bad idea. Uh, you know, behind our uh, church building, we have a bayou that runs behind, and sometimes it's got enough water to baptize. And so if one of the elders says, you know, why don't we just eliminate our baptistry and we'll baptize out behind the building? Well, I'm going to be pretty strong against yeah. that <laughs> just because I think it's a bad idea. Would it be unscriptural? Would it be unlawful? Not at all. But it's a really bad idea. Yeah. Which gets me to part B of my question. I'll just let this drop. But um, not only are there churches that don't have elders where any vision of leadership doesn't seem to exist, but in addition to whatever one of four or one of three, whatever it is, why are there so many of those congregations that do have elders that are sort of minimally on the margins? They've got two elders, so they're a heart attack or a transfer away from no eldership. Um, why are there churches that, that, on the other hand, feel the need to appoint men who may not be or maybe only marginally qualified? Um, and we could have that discussion. Or there are other questions we can move to. But if somebody wants to pick up on that question, I'm okay with that. Kyle, you've got the mic. You I just want to uh, explore your understanding of this passage uh, that we're talking about there. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, if this was directed to the church in Corinth, I might say, okay, this is, uh, they're divided in doctrine, they're divided in their understanding of the gospel. Here, though, as it's addressed to the brethren and describing why these different roles in the church are set up, explain how you understand what is being described here, coming to the unity of the faith. Is this maturity, or is it division over doctrinal error? I'm just curious how you all understand that. I believe that term, mature man, would be that that Greek word teleos, if I'm not mistaken, or at least a variation on it, which, you know, is, is not speaking in the case in a p application to man of being sinlessly perfect, but reaching a state of maturity 
uh, and which is always a growth process and an ongoing thing. So, you know, basically I'm thinking that this is saying that he, he, he gave gifts to men, going back up to verse 8. Those gifts are the offices placed in the church that involve oversight. Well, first of all, that involve revelation with the apostles and prophets that involve oversight with pastors, that involve the teaching and, and preaching, that would be evangelists and, and, and teachers. Unnamed in this, of course, are deacons, but they're implied in the idea of service, which is mentioned in the context. But all of those work together to effectively help each member grow uh, so that we reach an, an ever-increasing state of maturity. I, that, that's my concept of it. All right, I want to segue to something else, uh, unless there are questions from the audience. All right, David Dan's got a hand in the air there. Corey? I just want to um, follow up something our brother Max um, said about the operation of the eldership, where he's at in dealing with matters of judgment and then coming out of that, even if you didn't really agree or weren't really on board, coming out of that with one voice to the congregation as far as what the elders decided if you know it I guess culture influences us in a lot of different ways and something I've seen at times is where you have a kind of a supreme court approach to the eldership where you've got a, a dissenting opinion among the elders right not that it's formally published like the supreme court justices do uh, but privately where one of the elders may come out of the meeting where they've, you know, the elders have given their judgment and one of them comes out and kind of privately, you know, I didn't really agree with this. And, you know, some members are sympathetic to his view. And so, you know, he's going to let it be known that he didn't really go along with that, but he had to, had to sort of publicly agree with it. I think we can recognize how destructive that would be to unity in the congregation so what would, you, what would you suggest doing if you have a situation like that where instead of taking the approach that you've said you've taken, which is, I believe, the right approach, where you have somebody who is offering the dissenting opinion kind of behind the scenes, was that man even qualified to continue in the eldership? And if not, what do you do about it? I was not able to hear the question. What would, what, if you have a, a situation like you described where somebody comes out of a meeting with a dissenting opinion and you simply can't arrive at a, 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 a decision, then where do you go in that circumstance? Is that, David, is that the essence of your question? Yeah. <laughs> I think the clarification is if they did have a dissenting opinion and made that known privately outside that room, now, as an eldership who said, we're going to walk out of this room with a unified opinion, how do you handle that situation where someone has made their private opinion very privately well-known? We're talking about taking the dissenting pin opinion outside the room? Yeah, making yeah. it public. Yeah. The damage that's going to do. What do you do? That's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, that's, I, I guess... You know, we don't sign a document when we become elders, but we have an agreement that we're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just, I, I could not imagine among our elders, I couldn't imagine someone doing that. And, and not to say that it wouldn't happen, but you know, that's, for us, that would be like saying, I can't be an elder any yeah. longer. Wouldn't you have to have a discussion among the elders of can you really continue as an elder exactly. if you are the dissenting voice and you can't agree with, with what the other elders are saying? I mean, that seems a pretty logical next step. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, if, if someone goes out and starts saying, hey, the elders have this crazy idea, I'm the only one standing for the truth. Uh, the other elders have got to address that. Yeah. And, and that brings up a bigger question. How do elders address a problem within the eldership. And uh, I, I can give you a brief scenario. Uh, about six years ago, we had an elder that we feel was losing his mind, if I can say it that way. He made false charges against members in the congregation. We demonstrated those charges were not true. And after we demonstrated to him that, look, this, this is something that you need to drop, 
It is simply not true. He's calling people at 2.30 in the morning saying, hey, the elders need to do something about you because of your sin. And what do we do in a case like that? He is, he's calling a variety of people in the middle of the night. We had to act that morning on a Sunday morning, brief meeting before service and said, brethren, we have got to act. Uh, our brother has, for whatever reason, has gone into an area mentally that he cannot function as an elder. And so we publicly removed him from the eldership. We did not withdraw from him, but we removed him from the eldership because it was destructive to the congregation. Had we not done that, now you're looking for real trouble in the church because he's making false charges of adultery uh, against two or three or four people in the congregation. Uh, sometimes you, an eldership has to act. I've heard this thing uh, I remember when I was at 40th and Emerson, one of the old brothers said, once an elder, always an elder. But that's not a good position to take. No. And sometimes a man uh, disqualifies himself. I've told my elders, uh, the other seven men, if I come to the point where you think that old Max is so senile that he can't do this anymore, you tell him because he may not recognize it, but I want to be removed from the eldership. I want, and, and that's one of the things that we agreed to, that we're not going to insist on being an elder to the detriment of the local congregation. I don't know if that makes sense, and I think it's a matter of judgment how you handle stuff like that, but you can't tear up a church just because someone's got a crazy idea. All right. We can always circle back to any comment or question. Follow right, up Mark. just before we get too far afield from what David originally asked is there at Alvin over the years, whether it was four elders, three elders, or presently two, we've always tried to reach decisions based on consensus. You know, it wasn't a matter of voting and, and we're gonna we're gonna go with the majority. We reached consensus before we made major decisions and until we could get to that point, we didn't. We we just put we we held it in abeyance until it was time to uh, move forward in unity, but that idea of, vo of, of violating the confidentiality uh, of, of the, the thinking process that occurs uh, in, in the privacy of elders' discussions is a sure way to split a church wide open. All right, here's a question. Discuss the current trends in culture. I think that's been addressed by nearly every speaker we've had, um, but uh, I'll throw that out for the panel since that was submitted. Uh, who wants to talk about current trends in culture? Well, Steve, I would make just a couple of brief comments. Uh, that's one of the things that I have worked on for the past six or seven years. Uh, our culture is changing radically. Uh, we've, we've brought some people out of the 1950s among churches and brought them in the 70s and 80s. You know, uh, yeah, we can have a projector and we can do this and that. It's not even the year 2000 anymore. It's not 2010. Our congregation is so, uh, our, ch our churches are changing so radically. One thing is the single parent home or the divided families or the merged families. We have in our congregation out of 350 people, we have a number of single mothers uh, who have come out of bad situations who are now living godly lives, but they've got kids and it's a, a hard situation because they have to find a place to fit in the church. You know, it's, it's not just about the nuclear family. Yeah. Uh, ours is not a nuclear family church. It's a, it's a church for everybody. But that's one of the cultural changes that we're seeing. Right now, something like 70% uh, of black children that are being born are born out of wedlock. And among Hispanics, it's high. Among whites, it's also high. It is simply the way things are today. That's a major change. Uh, I could talk an hour on that, but that's, yeah. I, I just want to mention that about the problem with the family. Yeah, yeah demographically, I mean, that's absolutely correct. I mean, the, the shift, to, if not decline, at least leveling off of the divorce rate is in many ways res uh, the, the result of people simply not entering into marriage. Uh, they simply form a relationship and bring children into the world, even though they've never been married. So. Uh, that's a, in some ways a double-edged sword. Kyle, you look like you got something to say. Yeah, Max, I'm curious. Um, you know, we in the church are accused of being 
uh, racist and bigoted and all that kind of thing. How would you recommend with situations like you're talking about that we uh, open up to folks in those difficult circumstances yet still try to teach biblical models of the home and that kind of thing? Well, we teach biblical models of the home uh, as an ideal, but the truth is even in the nuclear family, oftentimes it's not an ideal. But I think I would like to answer more by just saying that our people in our congregations need to reach out to every part of the community. Jesus said, preach the gospel to everybody. That's our mission. And don't start qualifying people. You know, qualifying means, well, that lady down the street, I'd never invite her because she's a drinker. And th that couple behind us in our neighborhood I know they're living in an, an, an adulterous marriage. And so we start scratching people off. Jesus said he came to save sinners. Those people are sinners. And whether they're single parent mothers who've had two or three or four children out of wedlock, or whether it's a couple living in an adulterous marriage, we've got to speak to those people. And we, under, we underestimate the power of the gospel, Kyle, when we say, well, you know that they would never they would never dissolve their union. We have one just uh, two and a half years ago, right in the middle of COVID. Uh, we ran across a couple, and this man was hard-nosed against the gospel, but he began to read, and one of our elders began to study with him, and he says, man, that's the truth. I believe what the Bible says. I'm going to obey it. Well, we didn't know he was in an adulterous marriage, but he's reading his book of Matthew, and he comes across chapter 19. He calls his elder and says what about this according to this I'm in an adulterous marriage so what do we do we we look at the circumstance we ask him to explain we talk to his wife I'm in an adulterous marriage if the book says it it's true this man dissolved he and his wife dissolved their marriage and he died just about three months after they dissolved that union unexpectedly died of a heart attack but don't underestimate the power of the gospel to change people's lives. I think that's where we're falling down. We have got to do aggressive evangelism in our communities. And it's not enough to put up a sign that says gospel meeting and expect people to find you. You've got to go find them. And one of the ways you're going to find people is by having an outstanding, excellent website. The website is one of the doors into your church. Uh, when when people come to a community and looking for a church or people have a life crisis and they're looking for a church, they're going to check you out online. Used to be people go to the yellow pages, but there was no information there. Your website has got to be first class. And if it's not, you're really passing up uh, an opportunity. The other thing is personal invitations. All the statistics, whether it's Barna, whether it's Newhoff, uh, whether it's... Uh, well, all the groups out there that do the surveys, personal invitation is the number one way you get people in your door. But even after you give the personal invitation, they're going to check out your website because they want to see, will I be welcome when I go to this place? And so there needs to be something on the cover of your website that welcomes people right from the very beginning, not just a list of all your sermons that you've preached for the past two years. You've got to make your website welcoming, and that makes people think, why, well, maybe this is a welcoming church. And then when people show up, that's your field of evangelism. People are coming to you. They're coming to you to hear the gospel. And you've got to welcome them, make them feel comfortable. And uh, you and I, we've all been to places, folks, we've been to places where we walk in a building and nobody paid attention to us. And... Nobody spoke to you, and it's a sad thing. You know, I go to, I'm a car guy. I go to the Mecham auctions three or four times a year. And if you go to the Mecham auctions and get there early enough before the thing starts, they're going to play some loud music after they have the Star Spangled Banner. And then the whole crew, including the president of the place, the multimillionaire, he comes out and he's gre greeting the crowd. He makes people feel like, that you're welcome in this place. It makes people feel comfortable. 
We've got to make people feel that way in our meeting houses, even if it's a single mom or a hobo that comes in off the street. We've got to make people feel welcome. If we don't, we're passing up an opportunity. I'm done with the soapbox. Well, let, let me segue off of that and just say the part of not shortchanging the gospel is, I know in the Chicago area, I mean, we have in the Downers Grove Church and have I've been there 15 years, and we've had you know, African-Americans, Hispanics from different Hispanic cultures, Japanese, Filipino, Russian. I mean, every immigrant group that's ever come to Chicago winds up in, in DuPage County once they leave Cook County. And you can't have a gospel that's just a white gospel or say the gospel is different for a Filipino than it is for a Hispanic person or different for an African-American person. And I think sometimes we have not perhaps made that as clear as we, as we could have. Uh, Jim, you look like you wanted to say something, and you're holding the microphone, so what's on your mind? Well, just because I'm holding the microphone, uh, never mind. Uh, I really appreciate what Max had to say, and I, I think it spoke to, uh, you know, changing the culture of local churches, and, and I think that that is really critical, and I amen everything that, that you had to say there. Uh, one thing about the culture in general, uh, I think it was Ben May who was not too long ago interviewing Bill Hall, and, of course, Bill has got a track record of, of preaching for many, many years. And he asked him something similar, and I can't uh, quote him. I think I can give the general gist. Uh, he asked him, so what, what are the changes that you have seen uh, that are more remarkable in all your years of preaching? And Bill said, it is the dramatic drop in morals in the last 10 years. Um, you know, Kyle was talking about, Kyle uh, Campbell uh, was talking about the gradual decrease in some things. And, and over the years, we've all seen that where we could see that there was a gradual decrease in morals and maybe even in things like modesty among Christians and stuff like that. But it does seem like the last 10 years, it just seems like that that has just dropped off the table. And you, you think about that and you think, this is horrible. And it is. But that's a two-edged sword because light shines brightest in a dark yeah. place. And the darker this world gets, the brighter the light of the gospel will shine and the more opportunities we'll have to reach these different cultured people that uh, we have in our communities. All right. So let me ask, we've been talking about cultural differences and things like uh, single-parent families and the impact on women. So do any of our sisters who have addressed these issues uh, have some insight to share how 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 do we make congregations more uh, culturally welcoming to those who are affected by these cultural changes and the changes in morality Sherilyn I'm looking at you any I think is a very like you said I mean that is what saves men's souls, and we can all access that, and we can all make that a part of our lives, and we can see how it's going to impact us. So we've got to be in the Word, and we've got to, to believe it's the truth, and we trust God that he keeps his promises, and, and so everybody can have that hope and offer it to them, uh, whatever race, whatever circumstance they're in at that point. He right. has, it well, can thank you. Change their life. Thank you. You want to pass the mic to Sister Donna on your left there? <laughs> no. Anybody else? Audience, audience, comment. This is an open forum. Deborah has a comment. Okay. Yeah. I would just say, whether it's visitors or new members that have come from a very different background, that we remind each other to be very patient in their walk with Christ and not expect them to be at a level where people who have been Christians for years are. They're not going to understand everything right away. They're not going to change everything right away. And we've got to be patient with them. I see among our guests in the audience, Brother John Weaver. And uh, would you like to offer any observations you've got on what's been discussed? What's that? Not to put him on the spot, but here I am. As relates to the cultural differences, I would just echo what Bill Hall said, that the dramatic decline in morals over the past few years is, is notable. 
in the educational sphere, I'll just say that that's notable on our campus at Florida College in a variety of ways, perhaps most visibly in the apparel which students wear, which is a reflection not of the college, but of the homes they come from, I, I would say, as a father. <laughs> and so that's a, um, that's a huge challenge for us. Um, I think the other one that has been alluded to is uh, technology. Um, our children's minds are different than our minds are because they have been reared in a different information environment. And uh, even this conversation, the way it's occurring, <laughs> reflects a print-based model of culture where having read things, we sit around each other physically and discuss them um, for an hour and a half. <laughs> that is not our children's modality um, insofar as their minds are plastic and have been trained by games and web and social to think um, very differently than we do. And that has a profound influence, and we think not only about evangelism, which Max was talking about, but just even reading the scriptures. And I would just, I'll just add this one observation. Um, at the root of the restoration movement is an awareness of the scriptures that is detailed in its nature. We've talked a lot about patterns today, and the identification of patterns and the adherence to patterns requires a certain attention and a, a, um, a, an ability to grasp at the, at the minute level uh, nuances of texts and their implications. Um, I'm not saying that our children and the younger generation can't do that. What, I, what I'm saying is, is that the way they do that is different than we have grown accustomed to. And the way they read scripture, I find, is different uh, insofar as there is a much less an, um, ability at some level, but willingness to be sure to pay attention to scripture in, for a, a long periods of time. And that's, that's profound when you think about the implications for our, for our churches and our, and our, and our culture. Um, and then I think finally I would say um, um, the, the culture that I see our children in right now, I'm thinking about 18 to 22 years old, is one in which there is a desire for truth. That's, I think that's true across people generally. But the desire for truth is, um, is conditioned by a culture in which if there is a perceived exclusion of people based upon tradition or their social identity or their denomination even, um, that pursuit of truth can get shut down. In other words, we live in a, an arena in which people's perception of, of justice as a matter of, of inclusion within groups is paramount. And so what I find in talking about restoration movement and Bible is, is if we can talk about scripture, that's key, but if we emphasize uh, our identity over against other groups' identity, that's difficult for our students to, to swallow. And I think that's a real challenge in our culture right now as it comes to um, Christian teaching. So those, are, those would be a few of the cultural shifts that I would see. And, and then, you know, we haven't talked about this, but the reality is, is that most Christians don't live in North America. And so culturally, I think that we're needing to think through how in, at, a, at the level of spreading the gospel, we're, we're increasingly needing to look out beyond our American culture um, for our impact. Thank you, John, very much. And... Um the search for truth that you mentioned. I mean, this is an organization that uh, focuses on truth. It's, it's in our, our flagship, our masthead, whatever. And, of course, as you say, everybody will say they're interested in the truth, except maybe Fleetwood Mac, who sings, Tell Me Lies, Tell Me Sweet Little Lies. But everybody's interested in the truth, whether they can handle the truth or not. I think that's an important touchstone. And it kind of segues to another question. Uh, there's some others that I wanted to put out on the floor, but uh, how... One thing that I wrestle with more and more as my grandchildren get older, approaching college age, is how, how do we 
How do we inculcate these? How do we pass this torch back or down that searches for truth and that emphasizes the biblical detail that John referenced and that pays attention to the difference in union and unity? We all generally in this audience are probably going to say something very similar, but there are a lot of gray heads in this audience. Uh, we don't have many young people present. How, how is it, how, and maybe it goes to the leadership, quite future leaders that, uh, that Max talks about. So I, I'll just throw that uh, bag of questions out. Can I tag something on to that sure, question? absolutely. In light of what Brother Weaver was talking about, um, I think it was Jim that mentioned sometimes they don't ask the right questions. We need to help them see what questions. How can we help them to see the importance of distinctiveness or the differences that exist. They may not want to talk about those things. Yep. How can we help them? Steve, we had a comment back here. Let me yep. get that in before we get too far into the next topic. Everybody I know can have different experiences. I'm on a learning curve with the rest of you about what you've been discussing, how to reach out, how to work with people coming out of this tremendously different culture we had put out meeting announcements in the community and nobody came. A month later, a young girl about 20 years old just walked in. She had picked that thing up and make a long story short, I had one study with her and baptized her. She was coming off the street, fornication, drugs, alcohol. She said, don't give these people money with a sign. She said, that's just how we get our money to get drugs. Um, I was very happy, of course, to work with her, but one of my lessons is this. As we embrace these people, you had better be prepared to sacrifice a lot of time. I have never studied with anybody so hungry. After her baptism, she said, could I study with you maybe 30, just 30 minutes each day? That turned into one and two hour sessions for three months every day. And that doesn't count the time she'd call in the night or she'd be at work on a break and she read a verse and she didn't understand it. Uh, so anyway, maybe that's enough to get the main gist. What part of what I'm trying to say, we need to reach out to these people, but you, you have got to be prepared because they don't have a background. Some of them are very hungry to learn and they have all kinds of issues to deal with. You're going to invest a lot of time if you work with these people. All right. Corey, you're holding the microphone, and you may be one of the youngest heads in the room, although I see Danny Linden and Greg yeah. Prince is here and others. What, do you have a take on this intergenerational uh, issue? I mean, Corey's a guy that keeps the rest of us educated on digital and IT issues, but he has other strengths as well. So, No, I think the comment that Deborah made and Ron just touched on were probably my biggest takeaways. Um, where Dad and Scott are, they had a meeting in talking about evangelizing. And I made the comment to Ron last night, it hit me that if we are out there sowing the seed indiscriminately, the assumptions and expectations I've had of every Christian in that church needs to be tempered with that. That to Deborah's point, they will not be at the level of expectation that I feel like I grew up with. Oh, you ought to know better. They don't know better. And so it prepped my brain for this I guess destabilization, this, this set of norms that we all carry, well, that's going to be very individualistic as somebody's on their path and learning about and able to, to digest the milk and meat in the various stages that they are. And so if we're truly doing our jobs, uh, my lesson, my takeaway was I need to temper my expectation to the individual just like God does for me to know what I'm capable of handling. And so I think as we evangelize, you know, again, I'll just echo Deborah's, Deborah's one word, patience, that I'm going to have to have and time that I'm going to be willing to permit and, and give of myself. You know, to that end, uh, it impresses me reading, I love to read history, and in particular, uh, some of the speeches or the, uh, the, the things that have been written by Abraham Lincoln were so steeped in scriptural illusion. It was a part of the drinking water. It was a part of the air of that day and time. And that extended up probably until the mid fifties, you know, and, and yet it, we live in an age far beyond that where that underlying basic assumption that people 
know these biblical illusions and it resonates with, a, with something they've learned in the past is not there at all. And so it's a new world for us. It is, and something that scares me even more is that when some of our own people can't even say the books of the Bible. That's part of the changing culture. I mentioned some other names. Um, you're standing, Corey, you're standing next to Danny Linden. Danny, you got any thoughts as a younger preacher, younger person, part of a different generation certainly than mine or any of these guys up here, I think? Uh, I'm seeing kind of a push back toward the idea of wanting community again. You know, I think we had a rebellion against uh, the the organizations and the communities, all the, the civic clubs have gone that way where they've got declining membership and aging membership. Uh, but young people want people to encourage them and to help them. And unfortunately, what, where they're getting it is a lot of times in these like LGBT uh, support groups and the things online like that, but they're getting a, a body of people who tell them that they're gonna be okay and that they can make it and that they uh, you know, can, can survive the struggle they have in life. It's just another reason for us to know how important it is that we have good community as a church. Different standards, obviously, but community all the same. I'd, I'd like to hear from our speakers, ladies and men. You know, we've talked about unity and how unity can, biblical unity cannot involve uh, tolerance of error, fellowship with error. But as Deborah mentioned, we do need to have patience with those that are young in Christ, those that are immature. How do we identify that threshold when uh, it moves from simply being patient to we've embraced error, we're tolerant of error? Maybe the book of Revelation is where we start. You know, they, I gave her time to repent, but she didn't want to repent. And then eventually with Laodiceans, you know, and that woman Jezebel, you know, there was a time at which it had, there had to, the issue had to be addressed. Now, this is Christ, of course, addressing the issue. But there was time, and even a church as digressive, as you will, or, or, or really troubled and, 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 un, and filled with error, uh, they were still, I gave them time, you know, so there comes a point at which you, I guess, suppose people are not going to change, you know, or we're, we're basically shake the dust of our feet, so to speak, but time is certainly an essential element. You know, I, I think that it's very situation specific. Uh, it, it, to, to try to give a definitive answer that'll be so general that it'll cover every situation is just uh, virtually impossible. Uh, because, you see, you're not just talking about some doctrine error that someone who's a member of the church we are a whole. You're talking about uh, spiritual weakness in newborn babes, and you're talking about people that have to be uh, taken from, in, during the growth process, from uh, being a spiritual babe to where they ought to go get out grow out of some of these things and so it has to be to me very uh, individual specific uh, and in all of that you add a lot of love and you add a lot of patience as you expect people to grow one of the things that would tell me that uh, maybe there's been enough time is when uh, the, the individual that you're talking about becomes very adamant and dogmatic about whatever it is they're trying to promote. And so if it moves from a point where, man, th th this is something I, I believe, but I'm not sure about, to something I, you know, I'm pretty sure this is the truth, but then you start getting dogmatic and you start insisting that other people follow you and you start spreading things like that, then the, the, the day's over at that point. Does it work the other way, too, that uh, sometimes the end of the conversation and the end of patience comes when, when people are, at the end of the day, after patience, radically confronted with, this is what the Bible says, this is what Jesus teaches us. And your choice is, you can follow him wherever that leads, or you can do something else. And often that kind of a, of a difficult conversation 
is where the parting of the ways comes. And so people have to be confronted with the truth of the gospel and, and challenged in some ways. A am I going to follow Jesus or is that just a slogan? Am I going to do the hard thing in following all of the hard things that Jesus did? Max? Well, I would just make an observation uh, going back to Jim's talk today about uh, Matthew 18, 15. You, brother, you see your brother's sins or sins against you. Uh, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That is one of the most difficult commands that Jesus gave. We had a circumstance a number of years ago, and I, the story's too long to tell the whole story, but uh, a, a sister called me and said, we've got a problem, someone's about to leave the church because they weren't invited to a, an event this weekend uh, that some of the other Christians were invited to. And someone's got to go talk to them. I said, well, I don't know anything about that. You evidently know something about it. Why don't you go talk to them? Well, I can't. One thing and another and another and another. Anyway, uh, it came down to this. You're either going to be a disciple of Jesus or you're not. You cannot pass off what Jesus said belongs to you as an individual. You can't pass it off to someone else. How many times uh, as elders have someone come to you and said, hey, I've got to tell you about a problem brother so-and-so has. Now what are you going to do about it? Well, you know, you need to turn that around. What are you going to do about it? Because you're the one who knows about it. You need to respond. But it, it's challenging. But we come to those crisis moments, whether we have to decide, is he my master or is he not? Am I his disciple or not? I wanted to clarify, I misstated. Uh, it, was th it was Thyatira, not Laodicea, uh, that I was alluding to earlier when, it's, when it spoke of, I gave her time. But another example on the other end of the spectrum uh, was in years past, and I'll be as generic as I can here, uh, there was a case where the daughter-in-law of an elder uh, committed adultery. And that was a situation where that elder determined we are going to act decisively and we are not going to delay this at all and this is going to be dealt with in a very swift manner. He did that because of the implication that we got a double standard here. If we, if we drag this out, how's that going to look? Well, as it turned out, it was very successful for the church and for the individual who sinned because that lady was brought back. And so that was a case where, as Jim says, it depends on the situation. The, the need for giving time wasn't present. It was, action was needed, and that action changed the dynamic and, and really the outcome of that particular situation. Well, Jim mentioned that the adamacy that someone may have. Uh, Mark mentioned time. I'm curious, ladies that were speakers, y'all have any thoughts on how you can make that distinction between this is tolerating sin and just being patient with someone? What did you say? <laughs> Any, anyone in the group? Ron's got a hand up. <coughs> I think Alexander Campbell was the one that used the expression, the learning distance. As long as that person will stay in the learning distance, keep working with them, and realizing that you've got a whole bunch of levels of things they're having to learn and change and absorb, and so here's something obvious you're trying to address, and yes, you should keep trying to address it, but they may be learning something at a different level that will ultimately solve that. So where I'm headed with this is, as long as they keep coming into the learning distance, don't drive them away, <clears throat> work with them until they walk out when they're no longer willing to hear this addressed as you address it from time to time. A couple of thoughts that I had to my own questioning. <laughs> um, you know, as we're thinking about this, it may lead us to be cautious in how we assess our view of this congregation or that congregation. We may not know when it's an issue of how patient they're being. However, as Jim mentioned with the adamacy, if you do have leadership, if you do have teachers that are demonstrating 
a tolerance of sin, a tolerance of error, um, that may go beyond just the idea of patience. That seems to be embracing error. Right. Jim, here's a question that sort of is directed in some ways at your topic anyway. Um, you used the word accountability both in the title of your lecture and had a good bit to say about it. I, I think the word responsibility also ties into that. Uh, Betty and I heard years ago, heard, and she's repeated it, and I have too a number of times, heard Paul, Paul Earnhardt say, I'm really tired of people talking about I want my rights. Just once, just once, I'd like to hear somebody say, I demand my responsibilities. <laughs> so there, there is a sense in which responsibility ties into then being made accountable for what I am responsible to do. But the question is, how, how does accountability, how is that reflected both in the home and the church? And maybe is one more foundational to another? I mean, it occurs to me that, as some of us have said before, the, the home is actually the first great divine institution uh, and many times the lack of accountability that we see in the church and even in the culture at large is maybe due to the fact that we don't, we don't see it in the home. So that's the question. I think so. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that uh, maybe the root problem, uh, a lot of this begins in the home where uh, if you have parents who are uh, training their children, parents who... Uh, exercise discipline in every form. Uh, those people grow up usually to be accountable in every other area of their lives. On the other hand, if that's not the case, uh, if uh, uh, children are humored and allowed to have their way all the time, uh, then they grow up to be the ones that give their parents the most grief, uh, give their communities the most grief, because uh, there's just no uh, no accountability there. I asked a, uh, a a black gentleman, a black doctor who was a member of the church uh, years ago. I said, "What's the number one problem that is faced in your community, the black community?" And he said, "It's the problem of absentee fathers." Uh, and I thought to myself, "Well." That's not just the problem with the black community. That's the problem with the white community and every other community I know. And I, I really do believe that uh, it, it comes down to men. You know, we think about all of the problems that we have with uh, looseness with regard to women's roles and things of this nature. All of that comes, back, uh, comes right back on top of us, I think, uh, not being the responsible men that we need to be. Uh, and, and so if we have responsible homes... Children that are taught accountability, how to have to behave within a framework, then it seems like to transition that from uh, the home to society into the church is a relatively natural thing. Yeah. yeah, for all the rhetoric that we sometimes hear about unwed mothers, for every unwed mother, there is a largely absentee father in, yeah. in far too many instances. So it's something that has to be addressed on both sides of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, Steve Farrar wrote a book entitled Point Man, and it's one of the best books, I think, that has come along outside the Bible for men. Uh, the introduction to the book is worth the whole price of the book. It's really good. But he made the observation that the breakdown in the American home did not begin with uh, World War II and Rosie Riveter when she went out of the home and uh, uh, went into the workplace and never came back. He said the real problem was in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution where um, men uh, left the family farm or left the shops to go into the bigger cities, work on the assembly lines, and left the children at home to, under the care of the mother. Before that time, before the Industrial Revolution happened, uh, the boys would stay, uh, the boys uh, and uh, uh, girls would stay with their mothers un until six, seven years old. And then the boys would either go onto the farm or uh, into the shop with the dads. They'd learn not only uh, a work, uh, something to do to make a living, but they'd also learn the character of, of, of their fathers. When the Industrial Revolution hit, that took the a man out of the home and left the woman to do the raising of the children. Then more and more public schools were depended upon, and that adds a whole new and different level to this where other people are teaching and raising our kids 
uh, rather than than the man. I don't know the solution to yeah, all of that. I was going to say, turning back the Industrial Revolution does not seem like a viable solution. That, that's so. not a viable solution. <laughs> that, that, that's right, but it identifies the problem. And, and, I, and I think it's pretty obvious that, yeah, that right. you take the father out of the home and then everything else begins to fall apart. Comment from the from the sisters, or Mike Willis has a hand. He was a logger. He went to work at daylight and came home at dark. And had a fourth grade education, mom an eighth. They raised seven kids, four of us being preachers. Now, they didn't do that accidentally. I mean, it, it required a mother that took her boys to ladies' class <laughs> and had them there every time the doors were open. My dad was so busy making a living that he, um, he was restored when Cecil came home from Florida College and held a meeting in the area. And when he was restored, he never looked back. But I think you've got to go back not only to the amount of time that they're away, but what they're doing with their time. Uh, we were taught that the most important thing we have was to have our relationship with God. And that meant you miss football practice or you miss baseball practice or whatever it had to do. But when worship services came, we were supposed to be there, and we were supposed to pay attention. We could sit anywhere in front of her. They sat on the second seat. <laughs> and, I mean, now this, some of this is funny, but the family has been pretty good about passing that down to their own next generation. I see these parents hitting and missing for everything in the world, and then they wonder why is a church losing its grand its kids. It's not the church; it's the mothers and daddies that are not raising their children yeah. to have that kind of priority. That intentionality uh, that you that you're speaking of, I think, is so critically important that you you have to do that. We're down to five minutes, and I've got one thing I need to do before the end. But Jim looks like he's it, well. I was going to say, Amen. John uh, uh, Weaver and I had a, a conversation about uh, Florida College and, and uh, uh, you know what you do with the kids that, that are coming Florida because they came out of homes, yeah. and, and it's it's exactly the same thing that Mike is talking about. It's the kind of home that you come from. It's going to determine a lot of that. All right, I'm going to take the last few minutes here. Um, a good friend of mine who's now serving as an intern at Downers Grove is with us, Greg Prince. And, Greg, I'm going to ask you to lead us in a, a closing prayer in just a few moments. But part of his um, assignment this summer that he's come up with is grew out of a conversation about um, a, a comment. This has to be one of the five most important passages in all of Scripture. And then the follow-on question was, are there really five most important passages in all of Scripture? So Greg took that and ran with it and, and has put up online. Um, I will put it, again, it's on my Facebook page, but I'll put it there. Uh, unless, Greg, you can figure out a better way to get the link out here. But I would invite everybody to go to Greg's link and think about and answer the question, what, what do you think are the five most important text in scripture and the way we've defined that is not just a single bumper sticker verse like today's the day the Lord is made or I can do all things through Christ but some something between a verse and a chapter so not the Sermon on the Mount not three chapters but what what in your view of scripture are the most important most fundamental most foundational texts that either tell the story of scripture or identify big themes in scripture and then there's a place with each one to reflect on why why did you make this number one should my number two be number four would I bump number five up to three at some point and it's the process more than the product that we're interested in our conversation but but you can help us 
uh, advances conversation. So uh, we'll figure if you go on my page or Greg's page, uh, there will be a link there that takes you to this survey that uh, is part of his um, entrepreneurial project, I guess you'd say, as part of the internship uh, thing that we're doing. So anybody else? Questions, comments? We have three minutes left, actually. Any of our sisters have anything you uh, would like to add? Yes, Sister Mitchell. The mothers um, are the ones that really influence the children more so as far as being consistent and all that, you know. The fathers have the, have the place of the discipline mostly, I guess you could say, but the mothers play an important, as an important, I should say, role as the fathers do. Uh, it takes a team. And the fathers can be supportive of the, of the wife, the mother, uh, and demonstrate that to to their children. I mean, the the best gift in many ways that uh, a, a mother or a father can give to their children is is a loving, stable relationship of two parents, amen. not not just one or the yeah, other. I agree. So, amen to that. All right, Corey, somebody else. Uh, tomorrow on on the lecture, I'm going to give on uh, building spiritual leadership in the local church, uh, we're going to start with the mother's role in the home and how women uh, teach their children. And then we're going to work in, in as young as the children into the Bible class setting. But then as, it, as she then goes to, to uh, work with other women and, uh, and on up, and then how she eventually can uh, begin to encourage the men uh, in their roles, and she all in all this, she's going to keep herself in the submissive uh, sphere that she works in, and uh, so. But you got to start it early. It's uh, if you are hoping for that for your children or your grandchildren, you can work with them the same way. Uh, and uh, uh, I think God's given gives us the means. Uh, throughout all his, all our lives to be able to impact in our sphere. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. Thanks to the gentleman on the stage and all of you in the audience. If you'll pass the mic back to Greg, uh, nothing else from the stage, then why don't we be dismissed in a word of prayer? Thank you, Steve. Our awesome Father in heaven, thank you so much for the time we've had today and this week to join together with those of like faith to consider your family and your church and to look into this world and to see the pain that surrounds us, uh, to know that we have a story of comfort and healing that we have enjoyed, and to know that we have a responsibility to be faithful stewards of that family and your church but to also be the voice of the freedom that comes in knowing your son. Help us to be the faithful stewards that carry that message to this hurt and dying world. That we would have a love for their souls and a care for their pain and a heart in ourselves to show mercy and grace with every word and with every action that we take. You have been good to us beyond what we deserve. And so we, as your stewards, look to share that with those around us. We're thankful for the men and women who have studied in preparation for this week and who have given us their voice that we can grow closer in a knowledge of your scriptures and that in all things we would bring honor and glory to your great and matchless name. Bless us as we go our separate ways this evening and help us to return again tomorrow to enjoy the rest of our studies that your name would be truly glorified. It's in your son's most holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.
Good job, Mark. I appreciate you formulating some things. That was good. You yeah. always do a good job. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it's a joy to and, and easy in some ways when you have so many competent people up here. Jim, appreciate it. Thank you.